In the name of God, the God of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Last Sunday, Mother Elizabeth helped us understand these series of readings that we have from the book of Job over this four-week segment, reminding us that this is a parable or a story. In this week's reading, God answers Job out of the whirlwind we are told. And God gives us a bit of poetry around God's majesty and power. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me you see, in all fairness to Job, right, he's been asking God, why? Why? What have I done? What was my sin that this has happened? And so God continues. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? So in Job this week, we hear about the majesty and power of God. Job is reminded that he really doesn't understand like God understands. God is God and Job is not. God is God and I and not. God's majesty is also echoed in our psalm this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, how excellent is your greatness. You are clothed with majesty and splendor. You wrap yourself with light as with a cloak and spread out the heavens like a curtain. You lay the beams of your chambers in the waters above. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers and flames of fire your servants. You have set the earth upon its foundations so that it shall never move at any time. <clears throat> it is in this context of power and majesty, the power and majesty of God, that we hear James and John asking Jesus for a favor. At least here in Mark's version of the story, they ask for themselves. 
In Matthew's version of the story, they get their mama to ask for the favor. Now, it's easy to come down on James and John for asking for this favor, a favor to put themselves in a position close to Jesus. But don't we all want to be next to that majesty and power? Don't we all hope that, that God would want to be as close to us as we desire to be to God? Often it is Peter who plays the role of the human in all his humanness. In today's reading, it's James and John. The disciples want to be close to the teacher. They want approval. They want to be rewarded. We want to be close to God. We want approval. We want to be rewarded. And we want to be close to all that majesty and power. But maybe even more important, how is God defined in the words of John? God is love. Maybe more than power and majesty, we want to be close to that love. My friend, Carol Mead, who is a priest and an author, created this image. She wrote that in the Baroque music of the 1600s, and we are way out of my area of expertise here, she said a practice developed called basso continuo. See? It was a method of composition in which all the parts of a piece of music were built on the bass line. So the bass line, the deepest, the lowest tone, became the rock on which the piece was based and other parts were placed or sort of built onto it. So, okay. Carol believes that our spiritual lives are baso continua. Before we ever spoke, before we screwed up the first time or the most recent time, before we wandered, we were made in the image of God. Before all else, we are of God. We are of God's essence. We are of God's creation. We are of God's expression. We are of God's love. And we are here to listen for and to harmonize with that deepest voice, the call of God. So James and John, I think, I think they're just trying to get next to that deepest music, that power and majesty, that love. Now, clearly, I don't know what heaven is like. Just like Job doesn't know the answers to God's questions, I don't even know whether heaven is a word that makes any sense in referring to what is for us the next great adventure. But I have to believe that there is no one playing golf. 
No one fishing. No one doing whatever it is that you most love to do in this life. And it's not because you're not allowed to. It's because once you're in the nearer presence of that love, that majesty, you won't want to be anywhere else doing anything else. And I have to believe that there won't be any competition for the seat on the left or the seat on the right. We will all get a turn of equal amount. Or maybe more likely, God will have figured out a way that we are all as close to God as we can get without having to replace or push someone else away. And what does that love look like? We have a God who came to us not to be served, but to serve. That's what I think heaven looks like. We are all serving one another. Because that is what love is about. That is what God is about.